Welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. All you happy warriors, welcome to the show that does not wish you the compliments of the season. No, this is not the show that wishes you, oh, have a happy holidays. No, this is the show that joyfully and exuberantly insists that you have a Merry Christmas. A show that insists that you experience a joyful and uplifting Christmas. If you're Christian, well, if you're Jewish, like me, you'd still want to make sure that you're wishing your Christian friends not a happy holidays, no, a joyful Christmas. Because it's very simple. (laughs) Many of you will wonder, well, why would a Jew care whether people say happy holidays or Merry Christmas? Look, um, one thing is for sure, and that is that the leftist lie that the phrase Christmas makes me feel excluded or makes me feel as if I am not being included or makes me feel unhappy. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's all part of a deliberate strategy a strategy to secularize America. That's really what is happening. So uh, as our team prepares uh, today's show, uh, it's only a short time before Christmas, and I'll give you the year as well, 2018, because uh, these these shows, I know, pe- they stay around on the internet for a long time, and even now, I get emails and questions about shows that I recorded three or four or even five years ago. And so that's just how it goes. So here we are, Christmas 2018. And yes, uh, as a Jew, I wish you a joyful and uplifting Christmas with your family. And I do everything I can to encourage people to do that. Um, I got off an airplane recently, and somebody said to me, uh, one of the staff of the airline said, have a, have a happy holidays, have a happy holidays. And, and so I paused, and I said, well, thanks very much for such a great ride, and may I wish you a joyful Christmas. And she beamed. <laughs> she was, the, all kinds of unspoken words passed between us. She was saying, well, thank you. I'm so relieved that you're somebody who doesn't find the word Christmas offensive. Look, this is one of the the great lies of the left, that any mention of religion is offensive. People, we've got to get away from this. We've got to resist it. We've got to defy it, and we have to defeat it. Uh, the, The term Christmas is a wonderful part of America. I, I could do an entire show. Um, on what a good effect the holiday has on people throughout America. I could talk about how uplifting it is to see the huge numbers of people lavishing love on friends and relatives by buying them gifts. Yes, of course it's a buying season. That doesn't mean it's crass. It's commercial, yeah, because the way you get gifts to give to people is you buy them. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Christmas seems to bring out good things in people. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, I'm I'm so happy that some of the very best Christmas songs were written by Jews, like Irving Berlin, for instance. But um, that in detail might be for another show. Uh, for now, let me give you a suggestion for a, a Christmas gift. Um, the, and this is not this is not a, a commercial announcement. It's just um, s- something I wanted to tell you about. Um, I've got friends who have a company called Life Benefits, and um, they're they're based in Las Vegas. But what they do is they help people uh, develop financial stability. Uh, they help people prepare for uh, retirement. They, they help people in all kinds of situations. But 
Um, I only recently realized that they have an absolutely terrific collection of books in their store. And so make a note of this. I, I, I think you'll find it interesting, if nothing else. It's called Life Benefits, but there's a hyphen in between life and benefits. So it's life-benefits.com, right? Little little dash we call a hyphen. So lifebenefits.com with a hyphen in between the, uh, the, the uh, life and the benefits. And uh, head over to their store. And th- they've got books I really find terrific. Um, they've got Prescription for Wealth. Um, they've got something on retirement, really terrific, written by my friend uh, Tom McPhee. It's called Retirement Curveball. Be aware of that. And then, um, this is a very talented family, by the way. They're dear, dear friends of Susan and mine. And um, would you believe, but um, they actually have two children's books. One is called What I Heard in the Hall, and the other is called Grandma's Coffee Can. Uh, so you're looking for uh, gifts, wholesome books for, for young kids. Here's something that is not only, a, the both these books are not only lovely, but it's inspiring that they were both written by young girls themselves. And so I think you're going to find that uh, to be really, really terrific. Um, it's life-benefits.com. Go over to the store, and I think you will find stuff that you enjoy. Why am I talking about it? Um, because I like them, and uh, I think they're helping people in in very real ways. I've spoken for them a couple of times, and uh, and had a chance to interact with people whose lives are being changed by the strategies they're learning from from life benefits. So anyway, uh, be that as it may, I don't think you'll be wasting your time there. So um, we'll we'll go on with the show today, and I'll just let you know that uh, there is an organization called Wall Builders, which is founded, was founded, and is headed by a, a man I think is truly one of the greatest historians in America today. Now, normally when you say historian, you think it's going to be an academic historian, right? Somebody who occupies a professorship of history at a university and writes books you can't possibly read. No, uh, David Barton is um, is a guy who is a a real Western guy. When I visited his ranch not too far from Dallas, uh, we rode horses, we shot, we rode ATV vehicles. But uh, so Dave's a regular guy, and Wall Builders is a fantastic organization. And you might want to visit them as well, by the way, wallbuilders.com. Uh, if you really want the truth about America's founding, if you want the truth uh, about history. Honestly, in my view, I don't think one can do any better in terms of really getting to know the Judeo-Christian origins of the United States of America. Uh, I've learned an enormous amount from Dave Barton, and uh, what's more, uh, once a year, he conducts a huge conference in Texas to which uh, legislators, pro-life legislators from all around the country come, and uh, uh, this past November, I had the honor of being a keynote speaker for this event. And um, I, I, I listened to the recording of my speech afterwards, which I usually do. And I, I do that uh, in order to try and improve my delivery, to improve my speaking. And I will tell you it's painful uh, because I hear every single mistake. I hear every single thing I didn't include that I'd meant to include. I hear every word that I had not meant to say, but I did. And so listening to recordings of my speeches, I find incredibly difficult and and very unpleasant, but I do it anyways, most of the times, whenever I can, uh, just to catch bad habits I'm sliding into or uh, fix up mistakes for the future, whatever it is. But when I finished listening to it, I realized that in spite of the flaws, which I heard, and I don't think you will, uh, at least I hope, <laughs> I hope you won't, I realized it's, it was something that is really um, perfect for the audience. And so I'm pretty confident you are going to like this. And uh, if I'm wrong, I apologize, but I'm hoping very much you will like it. So here comes the speech I delivered for wall builders for a conference of uh, state legislators from around the country. 
um, on a topic that I think will make sense to you and will probably add to your uh, arsenal of intellectual ammunition for the uh, inevitable discussions and even debates we all find ourselves in these days. So, uh, without further ado, as introducers like to say, let's move on to the War Builders Pro-Life Conference, November 2018, Dallas, Texas. Rabbi, come on, brother. We could probably exchange stories of mean parents. You know how your whole life was ruined because of your parents. And um, there was a particularly mean trick my father used to play on me quite regularly. He would come home with a broken clock. Remember those old mechanical clocks you had to wind up? Not quite as accurate as a digital masterpiece, considerably more expensive, but much more of a work of mechanical art. That reassuring ticking noise. If somebody figures out how to introduce that to a digital clock, they'll do very well. (laughs) And he'd bring home these broken mechanical clocks. To this day, I have no idea at all where he found them. But he'd put them down, he'd say, Daniel, take this apart, figure out, put it together, make this thing work. This was the most futile and frustrating exercise of my childhood. And it never stopped. There must have been, I, I'm guessing, maybe, maybe 30 times. He came home and t- guess what I got for you? Another clock. And... I was determined, you know, on one, let me just make this thing work. I'd take them apart. I'd have the dining room table covered with hundreds of little gears and cogs and springs. And I'd take copious notes of where everything goes. Never was able to get it to work. Never was even able to get all the pieces back together again. And finally, finally, uh, it occurred to me, there's a way to stop this. All I have to do is actually ask him why he's doing it, which I did. And he said, well, I've a little surprised it took you this long to ask, but I want you to know that there is many wrong ways of playing with the pieces of a clock, but only one way to put it all together properly. That's it? He says, that's it. And that'll be useful to you in your life ahead, to know that there's only one proper way to put all the pieces back together again. Well, what was he talking about? And I finally began to understand. You know, the great 20th century cultural anthropologist, Joseph Daniel Unwin, uh, made the point that there are about 5,000 cultures in the world. But it's wrong to say 5,000 civilizations. There are 5,000 cultures. Most of them don't work very well. There is only one civilization in the world. Now, this obviously sounds uh, completely archaic to even say something like that today, but David promised me that we're in protected and defended circumstances here, and uh, I can say things that on a university campus would surely condemn me to um, severe punishment. And so I I repeat it. There are about 5,000 cultures in the world, but there's only one civilization. Says who? Well, it's not just me and Joseph Daniel Unwin. No. It's all the thousands, by now, thousands of Africans who have drowned in the Mediterranean in their frantic attempt to get to Europe. They say uh, this. They agree. When you ask what is the difference between a culture and a civilization, a culture is any way that a group of people live. A civilization is entirely different. A civilization is when a group of people are able to cooperate in a way that produces freedom, produces 
satisfying and healthy and wholesome male-female relationships that encourages the development of technologies in medicine that prolong life and maintain health, that, uh, that, that allow the development of an economic system that means that people no longer have to hunt and gather every day of the week in order to stay alive. These are the things that make a civilization. Somebody might well say, oh, well, look, uh, you're, you're confusing things here, Lappin. Uh, people struggle to get across the Mediterranean because there's more money in Europe than there is in Africa, to which I say, bingo! Yes! And that's the basic question. Why is it, to put it directly, why is it, do you suppose, that an indigenous system of capital has arisen only in Christendom? That's another old-fashioned word, by the way. You're not allowed to use that one either. Yeah, don't, you know, don't say the things I say. I mean, you know, because you don't operate under the same protections as I do. But, uh, but the, the principles will be useful to you anyways. And so, yeah, uh, it is true that no capital market has ever arisen indigenously outside of Christendom. Now, yes, today we have a stock market in Bombay and Beijing and Bangladesh, obviously. But that didn't start there. The concept of accumulating capital, as a matter of fact, the concept of a viable currency didn't exist outside of Christendom. Why? Well, it's, it's so basic that in this country, the greatest engine of economic prosperity ever, we actually put the words in God we trust, not on the walls of churches, but on the currency. Because without faith, there is no such thing as currency. You know, just ask yourself, why would a farmer anxious to be able to feed his family through the winter answer the door when a guy in yellow pants and a green checkered shirt knocks on the door and says to the farmer, I've got this great idea. You let me load up your entire harvest on this wagon of mine, and in exchange, I'm going to give you these little discs of metal. What farmer would agree to such a deal? It makes no sense. It only makes sense within a vast economic environment where huge numbers of people, bound by a common system of morality because without that, I wouldn't take your currency either, with a shared worldview in which work, struggle, achievement, vanquishing the odds, challenging the problems, all of those values are real, and that's not true in all parts of the world. It's not true for every culture. It's only true for a civilization. And so, while there are many, many cultures around the world, I can state quite categorically that not a single one of them has an illegal immigration problem. Doesn't that tell us something? That means that it's not just me telling you that civilization works better than anything else. That's all the people who vote with their feet and often with their lives. They choose where to go, and their choice is always places that Christianity built. That's where they go. There are not a lot of successful ways of putting the cogs of society and the springs and gear wheels of society together in a workable fashion. There's actually only one way. It's a lot of different cultures. You're welcome to them if you want them. But if you value the benefits of civilization, then there really is only one way that that works. Well, what is that way? Well, I had this beautiful rose adorning uh, uh, what was originally an unpromising rose bush in my garden. And this just grew to be such a splendid specimen of fragrance and beauty that 
I just felt bad that my visitors had to walk all their way down to the end of the garden where this rose bush flouted my incapable gardening efforts, defeated all my destructive impulses, and nonetheless succeeded in producing this beautiful rose. And I thought, why should everybody have to go all the way down to the end of the garden and crouch down over this rose bush? In order? And so I clipped it off the rose bush, and I brought it into the house and put it in a vase of water. And I thought I was pretty smart. Because for the rest of that day, my visitors oohed and aahed about my rose. And most of them would never have undertaken the pilgrimage all the way down to the bottom of the garden. And this way, they enjoyed it. And when the second day came by, I was still pretty full of myself. I thought, I can't imagine why everybody doesn't do this. But guess what started happening by the third day? Third day, my rose had petals that were wilting. And by the end of that day, they were getting a little discolored. And by the fourth day, there was absolutely nothing left. But that flower's sisters that I had left alone on the bush were still flourishing in all their fragrance. That severed flower looks awfully good at the beginning. But a little time goes by and you realize that when you detach something from its roots, it deteriorates. Not instantly, because if it was instant, even I would have figured out, bad idea. But it's not instant. You actually think you're pretty smart as it all wends its way through the first few days. Originally, this system of civilization that works was Bible-based. The principles that shaped the civilization, and you don't just have to tour through Europe examining the religious nature of the art and the architecture and the literature. No, it's pretty obvious anyways. It's clear when you realize that over 97% of all the technological advances in medicine, in science, in mathematics, between the years 800 and 1850, a rough, little more than a thousand years, all of that period, the discoveries overwhelmingly took place, not only in Christian societies, but in most cases, by Christian scholars and scientists. There must be a reason for that. Why is it that it is the book called the Bible that shaped the civilization to which the entire world flocks and which the entire world attempts to emulate on every level? Do you have any idea of what banks used to look like in Bombay and Beijing and Bangkok in the 1600s. They were guys who kept pieces of gold in their mattresses. There was no such thing as a currency system. There was no such thing as a banking system. And as time went by, cities developed like Birmingham and Boston and Berlin, and banks developed in those cities too. Did they emulate the banks of Bangkok and, Bo and Bombay and Beijing? No. It was Bangkok and Bombay and Beijing that emulated the banks that had been created in what we think of as the West. Now, needless to say, this stuff, I, I barely have to tell you, this is all horribly politically incorrect. Uh, we're not supposed to venerate Western civilization. It's all dead white males. You know the whole song, right? But I'm going to feel myself restricted this morning by only one rule, and that is tell the truth. Before we carry on, uh, I completely forgot something. I recommended that you visit lifebenefits.com, okay, life-benefits.com or life-benefits.com, and uh, 
I was singing the praises of some of the books available there. What I didn't tell you is that I asked if they would give a discount to listeners of the show because I told them I was planning on talking about their books, and uh, they graciously agreed. So 15% discount off any of their resources in the store at life Benefits or life-benefits.com. And here's the promo code to use. You ready? RDL 2018. RDL 2018. Okay. Uh, three letters, four digits. RDL 2018 at lifebenefits.com. So uh, that really makes, I think, it very worthwhile taking a look at some of the books there, which I definitely recommend and have recommended numerous times in the past. Okay. Uh, with that said, how about we move uh, right on and uh, continue with the speech I delivered this uh, this November to uh, the Wall Builders National Pro-Life Legislators Conference. And uh, there is nothing that I've told you today so far, and there won't be anything I plan on telling you for the rest of our time together, that in any way threatens that objective or in any way is difficult to verify. Because in our culture today in America, I won't call it a civilization any longer, but in the culture that is seizing control in America, the truth is not a defense. But over here it is. And so, when it came time to decide how to deal with human waste, the whole idea of cleanliness, the whole idea that a civilization needs to focus on beauty, not ugliness, a civilization needs to focus on the upward aspirations towards nobility on the part of human beings. Part of doing that is making sure that body waste doesn't flow down the main street of the village every morning. So you develop a sewage system. And once again, it is notable that Birmingham and Boston and Berlin did not copy the sewage systems of Bombay. But it's Beijing and Bangkok that have done everything they can to copy the sewage systems of the West. The whole concept of cleanliness, having an associative relationship with the development of a civilization, this is purely biblical. And so, once upon a time, the whole idea of what we today think of as conservative political values was attached to the plant. It drew its nourishments from the roots. But what we've done is we've detached the flower from the plant. And we have tried to develop a conservative politics that is intended to somehow exist independently of its biblical origins. That's the goal. And it actually looked pretty good for a few days. But now it's stopped looking so good. And the problem is because the other side has enormous advantages attached. What are its advantages? Well, at the beginning of the book of Genesis, uh, we're told that total chaos suffused the universe. That's what it was. And God began injecting energy on some level beyond our capacity to understand. And out of this absolute chaos and confusion emerges land and water, etc., and, and everything else comes about. From that day to this, we are left with that really important piece of information, which is that without the regular application of energy, and very often painful energy, my desk will begin to resemble a Bombay garbage dump. <laughs> Let alone my kid's bedroom. And I think to myself, how odd. Wouldn't it be nice? I mean, I didn't actually do anything to make that happen. It just sort of went that way. In the same way that if I stopped maintaining my motor car, after a few years, it begins to look and behave as 
a wreck. But why doesn't anything move in the opposite direction? Why is it that if I wait long enough, my messy room doesn't turn into a tidy room? Why, if I wait long enough, does the process of deterioration in a, an abandoned car reverse itself? And the only reason you're not astounded at that question is because we are so accustomed to living in a world where the default is chaos that we don't recognize the extraordinary miracle of that process. Stop injecting energy, and it all slides downhill. Now, the problem is that on the other side, it doesn't work the same way. You see, in the same way that gravity would assist, if we decided to hold a competition of strength, and the challenge is for you to move a 50-gallon drum filled with water 10 feet, and for me to do the same. And the only difference is I get to choose the course. My job is to move a 50-gallon drum of water from the roof of my garage to the ground, and yours is the same 10 feet, just in the other direction. I win. But it seems fair on the, on the surface of it, the only reason it isn't fair is because something called gravity, and we take it for granted. We've lived with it for so long, we, we, we say, okay, fine, that's not fair. But it's moving a 50-gallon drum of water 10 feet. Well, yeah, but you've selected the course in such a way that you benefit from the direction gravity pulls. Aha, exactly. How's about if, um, and they don't have this sort of thing in Dallas, but imagine there was a destructive street gang in Dallas, and we hired them for an experiment during this conference. We bring them in, we say to them, look, your job is to demolish the Omni Hotel. I would venture to suggest two facts. Number one, we will all be astonished at how quickly they achieve their job. And number two, we will also be astonished at how unified they all become in this great orgy of destruction. Lighting fires and breaking glass makes people feel a kinship with the others doing the same thing. And they will be unified in their virulent fury to destroy this building. And they'll go ahead and they'll do it. Part one of the experiment. Here's part two of the experiment. Part two is we now engage a team of architects and contractors and engineers, and we ask them to rebuild a hotel here. How long will that take? And let's even not look at World Trade Center in New York, where basically this experiment was carried out. Let's not even look at that because that was a government project. But imagine here, privately, in Dallas, we ask these engineers, and I'll, go ahead, please, put a hotel back here. Longer than it took, much longer than it took the street gang to destroy. Much longer. And what's more, there'll be debate and argument. What sort of hotel? Broadly, we agree, yeah, it's got to be a hotel, it's got to be built with reasonable costs, it's got to be eight floors, whatever it is. But the arguments between the various teams of engineers and architects, the arguments will go on for a long time. It'll take forever before the building. It's much harder to build than it is to destroy. And once we realize that civilization is a project that is based on a coherent biblical worldview, then the attempt to dismantle civilization is number one, much easier, because spiritual gravity is on their side, and it also unifies in a way that you don't find on our side. Destruction is easier than building, and destruction unifies the people engaged in it. What are they destroying? What they're trying to destroy is a Bible-based civilization. That's what they're trying to do. And 
Why do I say that? Well, any hypothesis can only be verified by experimentation, so we need to experiment here to see whether is it true that everything we think of as this vast fabric of political debate in the United States of America, something which appears to have so many moving parts and so many complex opposing views, can actually be boiled down to a very simple debate. You are either in favor of a Bible-based civilization, or you're opposed to it. So if you've ever wondered about the bizarre and inexplicable alliance between the American University campus and aggressive Islam, like, why do those groups share any interest? After all, if aggressive Islam were ever to win and Sharia law were to be imposed, those very students and professors would be its first victims. Ah, but that's then. Now is now. And right now, they share a common loathing for Western civilization. That's what it is. Um, Islam has a long memory. We all, we all know that September the 11th, 2001, was not a date pulled out of a hat. It was the anniversary of September the 11th, 1683, which was the last time that Islam attempted to vanquish Bible-based civilization. As they stood at the gates of Vienna, and it was the leaders of Christendom that put out a call to save because Vienna was the gateway to Europe. And then it was the Catholic uh, king, Sobieski of Poland, who comes to the defense of Vienna and rescue, and, and, and a hero to this very day among people who know that saved Bible-based civilization in its day. That's what we're dealing with. And the opposing side in America is attempting to dismantle that. This is why it is that, you know, sadly, uh, imagine a, a woman uh, suffering from an eating disorder. And she won't eat anything, and she's getting thinner and thinner. And at that point, what any responsible party does is bring in psychiatric help that helps this young woman recognize that she's not overweight. We try and help her gain a more accurate perspective of her reality. And cure happens. But what happens if that very same girl decides she's a boy? Do we bring in psychiatrists? No, that would be child abuse. We immediately adjust reality to suit her belief. What's the difference? The difference is only one thing. Only one thing. And that is in chapter 1 of Genesis, the words male and female, he created them. That's all. And anything written in that book has to be undone. If it's not written in the book, it's fine. There's nothing in, in that book about uh, uh, body weight. There's nothing in that book about smoking, which allows the left to be frantically anti-smoking. Yes, I understand, it's not healthy. But there are other activities in America or in human life that are equally unhealthy, and there's no opposition to those. Well, because those are prohibited in the Bible, whereas smoking is not prohibited in the Bible. And so one can become a fervent and religious about smoking without in any way being considered supportive. Why would it be that people who are okay with abortion are not okay uh, with uh, the death penalty. I do hope that you are enjoying uh, this speech and uh, that it provides you with useful information and, uh, and, and principles, I think, that you will be able to use effectively. I very much hope so, because I really can't think of anybody who is active in life and is completely insulated from the cultural conflicts that are uh, causing such turmoil. And, you know, we've got lots of listeners in Canada. Uh, we've got lots of listeners in Africa. We've got listeners, obviously, in the United Kingdom. We've got listeners in Switzerland and Germany. Uh, in all those places I've mentioned, 
there is cultural turmoil. And in all cases, it at its very root, it's turbulence over which side you come down on on the issue of Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, many people are going to say, look, I'm just indifferent to it. You know, I'm just, I don't care either way. But wait a second, you actually do. Not necessarily over the biblical issues per se, but in almost any walk of life, no matter what you do and almost any way you do it, if you look at the implications of each side, if you look at the policy prescriptions and political goals and aims of each side, you eventually will say to yourself, well, I'm, you know, I'm not really wholeheartedly on either side, but if I had to choose, I'd be on this side. And so the two sides, of course, are those who regard Judeo-Christian principles as vital for civilization's survival, and those people who see those very same Judeo-Christian principles as uh, primitive obstructions to what they see as progress. And so if you realize how damaging progressiveness is uh, to your family and to your finances, then you probably want to be on the side of understanding the Judeo-Christian roots of conservatism. And that's, of course, exactly what the speech is all about. Um, I gave you the discount code for uh, lifebenefits.com, life-benefits.com, RDL 2018. I also want to direct you to our website, which is rabbidaniellappin.com. And the reason is because uh, again, this time of the year, gifts, right? We're all getting gifts for folks. The uh, books that we have created, Thou Shall Prosper, Business Secrets from the Bible, uh, Buried Treasure, uh, these books are available. You won't need a discount code. They're available uh, for everybody listening. You just have to go to rabbidaniellappin.com. And uh, if there has ever been a time when you thought that somebody in your family or somebody in your circle of influence or orbit of impact um, could use a Rabbi Daniel Lappin book, such as uh, Thou Shall Prosper, The Ten Commandments for Making Money, or uh, something that provides input on family, well, uh, what I'm saying is that there is not a better time than to go than now to go to rabbidaniellappin.com, take a look at the the books that you want, and I think you will be gratified at uh, how easy and inexpensive they are to obtain right now as we approach not the holidays, not the festive season, but Christmas. That's right. And so uh, a joyful Christmas to you all, but uh, let's go back for the conclusion of the speech, shall we? Because the Bible says that... uh, Murderers should be executed, and babies shouldn't be killed. So obviously, if you're attempting to dismantle civilization, a Bible-based civilization, it goes though. Now, they're not, they're not fools. They're not stupid. They're not trying to bring everything to an utterly disastrous, catastrophic end. No, they believe there's a second way to put the clock together again. They believe there's a better way to put the pieces together again. Destroy, take down, dismantle Western civilization, destroy capitalism. You you hear all the slogans. But what they're trying to do is reassemble something that'll be better because it doesn't have the same restrictions that we have. But there are certain reasons why a Bible-based civilization has achieved the success that it has achieved. For instance, it's not an accident that wealth has been created under the Judeo-Christian Bible system, whether it was the capital markets of London and Amsterdam of two centuries ago, or whether it's what we see in more recent times, but every culture that wishes to progress copies the West. The West doesn't copy them. They copy because the Bible-based blueprint produced the most viable civilization. 
I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When it comes to money, it is, it's such a clear thing. You know, in the, uh, in the beginning of Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse um, uh, 15, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm quoting directly King James' translation. Uh, put God, Adam in the Garden of Eden to work it. Then we also have in uh, Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, um, verse 9. Six days you must do all your work. I've given you two work verses, okay? In the Garden of Eden to work, and six days you must do all your work. Now I want to give you two more verses. We'll put them on this side. We've got a verse that says, uh, chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 7 Uh, Verse 16, Um, say to Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me in the desert. So I'm going to put the worship verse here. I've got the two work verses there, right? I've got the worship verse here. I'll give you one more worship verse. Um, Last chapter of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 15. Um, You guys, you you think you're going to practice idolatry and abandon the God of Abraham? You do what you like, says Joshua. But as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. So we got Joshua worshiping the Lord and Israel leaving uh, leaving Egypt to worship God in the desert. And we've got Adam in the Garden of Eden working, and we've got Ten Commandments, the Sabbath day. Six days you shall do all your work. And it's very nice, excepting that not everybody knows that in the Lord's language, the Hebrew original uses only one word for all those four instances. The implication of this is enormous. What this means is that worshiping the Lord and taking care of your customers and your clients is all part of the same thing. Worshiping the Lord is not something I do on Sunday or Saturday. I do it every time I take care of another one of his children. Now, are you surprised that Jews are disproportionately successful with money? How can we not be? When we go to work on Monday morning, it's with a totally different attitude. Not working for a paycheck, I'm working for the opportunity to take care of another one of God's children. The money comes by itself. But it changes everything. That is something that was more widely known and understood in the West than it is today. But nonetheless, it is an example of what happens when you abandon the roots, when you abandon the basics. Because the great thing about socialism, the great thing, and David mentioned that uh, one of our resources that uh, we make available um, is about the Tower of Babel, the origins of socialism. Because one of the things we have to understand is the incredible seductiveness of socialism. There is a reason why young people on the campuses of America are embracing a system that wants to destroy every luxury they enjoy in their lives. It is very seductive. And the reason is because socialism hasn't abandoned its roots. Everybody in it has a broad understanding. They may not necessarily all relate to the idea of, oh, we're, you know, we're here to dismantle the Bible and the kind of civilization that it builds. They don't necessarily go as deeply into it as that. But they are unified in the idea that everything that, quote, the West has developed is evil, wrong, and bad. And that socialism, that is a a political system based on verses in the book of Isaiah, which speak of the breakdown of power into its three component parts, everything has to be demolished. The entire system of socialism speaks to a comprehensive worldview. It is, in fact, a religion in the sense that every religion has to answer a basic transcendent question. The difference between a tennis club and a religion 
is that only a religion explains where we came from. Why are human beings on this little remote speck of a planet in a far-off galaxy on the edge of the, uh, of the universe? Why? What? And there are only two viewpoints. The one viewpoint is that a good and loving God created us in his image and put us here. And the other is that by a lengthy process of unaided materialistic evolution, primitive protoplasm turned into bookkeepers and ballerinas. That's, oh, it's very rude to laugh at other people's religion. <laughs> and it all flows from there, because if indeed that's all we are, then we are nothing but sophisticated animals. And animals need zookeepers or farmers to take care of them. And those zookeepers and farmers don't live by the same rules of the animals. That's absurd. Who would expect them to? They're the farmers. They're the zookeeper. We're the animals. That is one viewpoint. And everything flows from that. And so there's a, there's a coherence to it. Right? Nobody on the left is having debates about, well, you know, we're, uh, we, we, we're against the Second Amendment because we don't like killing, but we're okay with abortion even though it is... They don't have those debates because they don't need to. It all fits into their coherent system. It isn't about killing. It's about obliterating a Bible-based system. That's what it is. And replacing it with something entirely different, which exists only in their dreams. The utopian vision exists in their dreams, but that is what a religious vision is. It's things that exist in our dreams. They are hard to describe, and they are hard to shape. And so on the most critical and important areas, namely the three areas of faith, male-female relationships, and money. Those are the three areas. And you just think about it, right? If you're okay with God, if you're, and again, male-female relationships or sex is just another word for family. That's what creates family at its heart. And so if you're in good with God and you're good with your family and you've got a few dollars in the bank, there should be two bald spots in the carpet next to your bed where your knees go every night. What's there to complain about? And so not surprisingly, the biblical system focuses on sexual and family areas. It focuses on financial areas. And it focuses on connection with God. And when all of that is put right, we've got a system that works. The other side also has a system. And our system is rebuilding this hotel, which is a hard, hard, hard job. Their system is destroying it. Now, they don't talk of it in those terms because they're only destroying the hotel in order to build a much better one in its place. But in places in which they've succeeded, we don't see much better hotels in its place. We just see rubble and human wreckage and suffering. But it's a system nonetheless. And so the, uh, the, the solution, well, uh, the solution obviously depends on your fortitude and your courage. Uh, it depends on me getting hold of my gardener and asking him to please graft that flower back onto the plant. I've learned my lesson. Detaching it from the plant only guaranteed it was going to wilt and fade, and nobody would come and visit me to see it anymore. But when I left it where it belonged on the plant, and yes, it did take a little bit more of an effort, yes, that's true, people came to see it. And so the restoration of the virility of conservatism, in my view, depends upon replacing it, putting it back, connecting it to its roots, so as it can once again be sustained and be nurtured by something that is a comprehensive solution, 
a comprehensive blueprint to all of our concerns in building not a culture, but a civilization. And I don't think that I will sound in any way insincere. I don't think there is that risk if I say that I know that not only do we turn our gaze to you in hope, but we also look to David Barton and Tim Barton and the whole Wall Builders organization to provide guidance in how to restore that flower to its roots. And I know that our hopes in this area are not in vain, that we will indeed be able to restore the original vitality and virility of conservatism, which is really just another way of saying the political and social system designed by the Bible. That's all it really is. And once we grasp that and we're able to see all the implications in policy having to do with gender and sex, everything, all the policies having to do with money and finance and trade, and everything having to do with faith in our boss, when we've got that clear, we, if we understand the practical implications, because remember, politics is nothing other than the practical application of our most deeply held values. And we all know what those deeply held values are. And um, I will, uh, I'll finish off with what would be often termed a shameless commercial plug. But I don't see it that way at all. I see commerce as part of God's plan for human interaction. Human beings can live together either with guns and force. That's called the communist system. Or we can live together with a healthy and comfortable respect for economic interaction. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I burst out laughing. Uh, Newsom running for governor of California is the latest politician to fall over his feet telling a flagrant lie about how he grew up in poverty. Why? The Bible doesn't venerate poverty. The Bible doesn't equate poverty with virtue. Not at all. But if you believe that, if you're on the side of those who would destroy the building, well then, yes, then money is bad. And only government should have it. Because if individuals have it, do you realize the danger? They could become independent. <laughs> and that's why so many politicians struggle and lie to prove they came from poor circumstances. It's, it's complete nonsense. In many cases, that wasn't true. But it somehow cloaks them with a sense of virtue. It also is a dead giveaway as to which side of the war they are on. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future. Uh, America uh, came into being by a war of independence that was fueled by the passion from colonial churches. And slavery was abolished by a second religious revival. Slavery was abolished again because of the energy and the fever that flowed from the pulpits of the churches, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States. And we're ripe and ready for a third great Christian reawakening. Ripe and ready. Because when we can restore people's understanding of where the flower really comes from, well then we're well on our way towards success. And so for, for those of you who want to have access to more of the details, we uh, unabashedly and very comfortably bring material here to sell to you. And yes, guess what? We will make money doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. And you will acquire ammunition and tools which enable you to more effectively do your job. And that way, with God's blessings, when we have the opportunity to meet here back again in Dallas on another occasion, we will be able to look around at each other 
and congratulate one another on the faithful service that each and every one of us has provided in every dimension of our lives. Thank you for being here, and thank you, Bartons and Wall Builders, for bringing us together and giving this, uh, us this opportunity to share. God bless. Well, that's the end of that speech I delivered this last November in Dallas. I hope you enjoyed it, and please do write and tell me. Go to our website at rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, let me know. Or, uh, you know, wherever you're listening, whatever it is, find a way and uh, shoot me uh, an email. You can do it on Facebook at Rabbi Daniel Lappin or on Twitter at Daniel Lappin. Um, there's even an Instagram, if you don't mind, Rabbi Daniel Lapp, an Instagram. Would you believe, would you believe that I am on my way to becoming an Instagram sensation? Uh, if you say, no, I wouldn't, then you would be a wise and prudent person. But, uh, at any rate, love to hear from you, particularly about this particular podcast. Uh, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com books on special price for Christmas, and um, you'll find those in the store at rabbidaniellappin.com. The books are Buried Treasure, uh, Business Secrets from the Bible, Thou Shall Prosper, and uh, you you, you even may not have some of them now, so at least go there and read about them and see whether these books convey practical, hands-on, life-changing information that is uh, something you need in your life right now. If it is, you know what to do, rabbidaniellappin.com. I also gave you um, a uh, a discount code for some books created by a a wonderful family. We love this this family and these people. Uh, Their company is called Life dash benefits.com lifebenefits.com with a hyphen or a dash in between and uh, if you see uh, take a look at those the two kids books they are so adorable Um, but if you see something there you'd love to get for uh, someone in your circle uh, don't forget use the discount code rdl2018 rdl2018 and you'll find that uh, that will uh, save you a few dollars here and there. So go for it and enjoy. Thanks so much for being part of the Rabbi Daniel Lappin show. Remember, this is the show that never wishes you a uh, holiday, happy holidays, or a fine winter season. No, nothing like that. This is the holiday on, this is the, re- the, uh, the, the show on which we enthusiastically, heartily wish you a Merry Christmas, a joyful and uplifting Christmas, because Christmas is one of those many things that make America exceptional. America's Christian nature at heart is part of its exceptionality. Exceptionalism uh, might be a better way to put that. And uh, I, for one, uh, defiantly resist the deliberate, relentless attempts to secularize America and to steamroller away all vestiges of its Judeo-Christian origins and its present and its future. So uh, with uh, ardent and enthusiastic fighting the forces of secularism, I am your rabbi wishing you not only a joyful and uplifting Christmas, but good times in the areas of your life having to to do with friendship at this time of the year, right? Friendship, family, yes, finances, and of course, let's not forget faith. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Thanks for listening. God bless.